What I've usually done and seems to go over well is just take the review and go through it page by page and just talk about some of the highlights and let me just bring, you know, remind you of some things. Um, however, you know, if there are certain areas that uh, you want to start with first, like the um, agency or offers and contracts, we can do that. Um, I mean, we can approach this any way that you want to. But having it as if it's a lecture, a straight review, is an okay way to do it. Better than okay, really. Um, let me remind you, I've got a good review on um, YouTube. Um, Barry t uh, videotaped me my last class, and the review was excellent. We, I, we really had a good review. So you can go to YouTube and look at that last review. It'll help you. And uh, this one's going to be taped today, too. And so it, uh, it was really good, one of the best reviews we've done. Class was, uh, we were organized about it and uh, not too much chatter, and it went well. So tell me what your needs are when you're getting ready for the test other than math because we could, we could spend a lot of time just doing the math and, and really and truly, and I'm not trying to play it down, there, there are 13 math questions, so that means there's a whole lot of other questions, doesn't it? So let's do what we can on this, and then if you've got a math question or two, we'll try to work it in. Um, I'll stay again today. Uh, I can stay for about an hour is all I can stay. Um, I told the group that stayed yesterday, I'll stay one more day if y'all if y'all need anything. So, what do you want to do? Let's do the outline. Let's do the outline. Okay. So, unit two, three questions. Now, let me just say, uh, let's find fixtures in your book because here's the idea. You know where the, the question's going to come from. I'm not telling you what the question's going to be about fixtures, but it, you know that you've got a question about fixtures. Now, in my humble opinion and from my experience, here's what I would do if I were in your shoes. I would find fixtures in my textbook, which would be on page 25, <coughs> and 20, uh, bottom of 24, 25, 26, 27, 28. Those few pages talks about fixtures. I would study those. In other words, uh, knowing about um, trade fixtures, agricultural fixtures, knowing about personal property versus a fixture, but probably concentrating on page 25. Knowing that a fixture is an, uh, something that was personal property and became attached to become real estate and is intended to stay with the property unless Unless the contract says otherwise, unless the parties exempt it. Everyone, it would be in your best interest if you read this in the sales contract because good questions are, are seller didn't leave the chandelier and the buyer thought it was going to stay and nothing was mentioned in the sales contract. Is the chandelier a fixture or personal property? And so just hear me say that real fast. What would you say the chandelier is? Fixture. So I would read, read this thoroughly because it's a level three question. And so it'll be more than what's the definition of a fixture. They're presuming you know it, and they'll probably give you a little scenario question. So reading your sales contract, and it, showed, it gives you that uh, paragraph or list of all the items that are fixtures, and read how it's worded. These will stay unless either party excludes it. And that means that the buyer can exclude it too, doesn't it? Buyer can say, I don't want that chandelier. Uh, get it out of here. All right. Joint tenancy with a sale or a death. Uh, so let's talk about that. Here's what I hear from students. I always get confused over joint tenancy and tenants in common. That's what I hear from students. Well, the big real difference between joint tenancy and tenants in common would be what? <laughs> okay, that's true, but say it again, Justin. Survivorship. Survivorship. There are some other differences, purchasing it at the same time, but the bottom line is the big difference is the right of survivorship. Tenants in common does not have the right of survivorship. 
doesn't have it, can't get it. So tenants in common is always willable. Tell me if that makes sense. It's always willable because you cannot add right of survivorship. Joint tenancy, we said, for test purposes, and realistically, why would buyers choose joint tenancy anyways? The reason they choose it is because the right of survivorship, don't they? So joint tenancy, um, the right of survivorship means it is not willable amongst the, um, the owners who own it cannot will it. And Kim in the back said, another feature is joint tenancy, it's all, everything's at the beginning. You'll see the words in your reading that say unity and time and possession and, and place and undivided, well, undivided interest would be in both of them, but you do see all that unity. You might see words like that, unity of time and place and title because it is at the beginning and everybody's name's on the, on the same deed. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. um, if you did do uh, joint tenancy and you didn't do right of survivorship, could that then be willable? Or is that just... Like, Technically, uh, yes, but that's not the way you'll be tested. Okay, good. But you understand that, right? Yeah, I just, okay. they're not going to like try to put some stuff on the test that like trick us like that. Um, I mean, for, but that's specifically like joint tenancy. Yeah, no, no, not on that. Not on that, yeah. Here's what we said in class many moons ago. So I'm not going to fuss at you and Portia for not remembering. Um, what we said in class was you will be tested as if right of survivorship is with it. Okay. So if you get a question and it says, um, Ian and Linda and Jose bought a property as joint tenancy, whether they say right of survivorship or not, it is for your test. And the reason is, why else would they buy it that way, right? That's why people want that. Does that make sense, everybody? They want it so it's not willable. And um, why would people want to own property where you can't will it? Why would people say, we want to buy this together and we don't want anybody willing it? Why would, why would that be? Because they want to take over the interest of the other people once they're done. They, won't, they don't want other people coming in and kind of mucking up everything. We don't want your children coming in and telling us what to do. Guys, it could be, um, it could be people that are partners. It could be, um, well, before gay, uh, before gay marriage was legal, that would have been perfect. Because if, if I die, you, you, you own the property. And nobody, no outsider is going to come in and say otherwise. But I can imagine... Friends wanting to uh, buy property together, and let's just keep it with us. We worked hard for this. And so if I die, y'all get it. If the other one dies, y'all, whoever's left. So I can see the need for it, although it is extremely rare in North Carolina. But you probably are going to be tested on it. So what that means is when one person dies in joint tenancy, it goes to the remaining co-owners. So if there are three owners at the beginning, we know it's one-third, 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 unless they say otherwise. And if one of those passes away, now the remaining two own one-half. They share, you know, they just kind of gobble up the difference. And then when one of those last two passes, the last person owns it in severalty, and now it's willable because it's solely owned. So right of survivorship, I would just remind myself, that means not willable. Right of survivorship means not willable. Now, I've seen test questions, and this is testing you on your knowledge, and it feels tricky, I'll give you that. I've seen test questions, probably maybe more on tenants by the entirety, that a husband and wife own properties as tenants entirety, and the husband made a will. When he died, he wanted his son to have his property. He made a will, and so when he dies, who gets the property? The wife. So you need to know whether they make a will or not. If you own as right of survivorship, the will will not be enforced. Does that make sense? Guys, they're sending you down a tangent. They're trying to distract you. And so you see that will, and then you go there, like fetching a bone. And then you go, well, the son gets it. Not if there's right of survivorship. Right of survivorship will take precedence. Is everybody good? Mm -hmm. So what if they, um, there's a divorce, and they are the students of entirety, and then there is a divorce? What? Okay. What's, are you confused? No, I'm, 
Kim and I are straightening it out. Okay, good. Question. What if there's a divorce? Well, then it's tenants in common. Remember, the law says if you own as a married couple and become divorced, the law says it's tenants in common, and then it's willable. But if you're separated, it's not. It's still entirety. Separated is not the same as divorce. Yeah, y'all had a little question on that, didn't you? So they were divorced, and one of them died, and it would just that share of the house would go to, or the property would go to that person's heirs. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Because tenants in common is always willable, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Joint tenancy. Um, remember, we can sell our real estate. So if we're selling in joint tenancy, we're only selling the, the share that we own, the interest that we own. Isn't that correct? Mm -hmm. And by the way, if you want to go borrow money to buy into that, into that ownership, you can't mortgage the entire property because you don't own the entire property, do you? Nope. It, so I, I, would, I would think, I don't know how easy it would be to get a mortgage if you don't own the whole, pro whole property, but um, anyways, just your share. Okay, condominium ownership compared to a townhouse. What do you think that's about? Well, tell me some differences. Townhouse versus condominium. Oh. Okay, Justin. Uh, townhouse, when you're doing the uh, measurements to see how much living space you go I believe it's two inches in, into the wall. Um, six inches. Six inches was my second guess, actually. Um, <laughs> and with, with condos, it's just, um, the, it's like the, the air, come on, like, give me a second. <laughs> it is the air space. Air space. Two words. Okay, guys, let's, let's, uh, let's, let's listen. Justin, say that one more time. Uh, with the townhouse, it's uh, six inches inside of the wall when you're doing, um, Descript, uh, describing like the square the, footage. Right, exactly. And with the condo, it's just the airspace to, for the square footage. So we know, thank you, we know that when you buy a condominium, you are buying real estate. You do get a deed, you get a title. You all understand deed and title can be used interchangeably, right? You get a deed to the unit airspace and it's considered real estate. So you, uh, he was saying when you're measuring for square footage on a condo, you just measure inside wall to wall. Yeah. If you're measuring a townhouse and it, if it's awkward to take the exterior, well, you would add six inches to each exterior wall because when you own um, uh, properties that, um, if you own a property that's detached, don't we measure the exterior if you possibly can? Well, a townhouse is attached, but it's almost like it's a single family dwelling that just happens to be attached. So you do count the exterior walls on a townhouse, and six inches is the, is the amount of an exterior wall. Uh, what else are, would be a difference in a condominium and a townhouse? Uh, Kim? In a townhouse, you own the land underneath it. And air, space. So that's good, you own that footprint. You probably have a little tiny bit of a little backyard uh, with, the, you know, you can have a little um, table out there or something, it ain't gonna be huge probably. And uh, condo, uh, you don't own the ground underneath uh, the same way, and the air. Condominium doesn't just apply to residential, it can be commercial, industrial, all different types. Yeah, we've had a couple of questions like that. Condominium can be any type of use. And even though we could overthink and go, oh, I don't get that, just say any type, industrial, commercial, any type. Renee, what do you want to say? I was going to say that um, with the condominium, you own the common areas, um, tenants being common, and with the, the townhouse, um, the HOA owns the common area. Excellent. Renee reminded us that as a condominium purchaser, you own the common areas, the amenities, we could say the structure, the parking, uh, everything as tenants in common. If you buy into a townhouse community, the homeowners association is an entity and they own all of the common areas. And of course, uh, all the folks who live there would be a member of the association and pay dues, correct? In a condominium, you're a member of the association and pay dues also. I can think of another uh, thing. Bang. Bang. What about a uh, brand new condo purchase? What do you know about that? Oh, yes. 
Kim said we have seven days to resend. Seven days right to resend on a brand new condominium. What about a pre-existing uh, sale? Is there a right of rescission? No. no. Um, but the owner does have to give a statement um, about the homeowners association and the dues and any kind of assessments and that sort of thing. Okay, everybody pretty good on that? These questions, these first questions that you get um, in these units, they should be pretty quick. You know, you should be able to read it and get through it. I'm not saying, I'm going to say you still need to read carefully. You know, we found that out even on one-liners, but, uh, but you should be able to get through. Unit three, lien priority. Um, what establishes priority of liens? What, um, what um, recordation. recordation? Thank you. I knew uh, my question wasn't quite. Pure ultra. Huh? Pure ultra visa life estate. Oh, uh, what is the what is the race the race state? Pure 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 race system. Pure yeah, pure something. Pure race system is recordation. So I ask you, what establishes priority? And um, we, uh, Kim and some of the ladies and um, Cameron too said, it's recordation. Guys, I would remember the Connor Act. The Connor Act says record to give notice to the world, which means third parties. Uh, recording gives notice to third parties because um, it prevents third party claims. You know, you're notifying, you're getting yourself on record. We're talking about lien priority right now, but it's really like first come, first serve, usually, isn't it? And so we race to the courthouse, pure race system, to get the liens on record. Now, when I say we, it would be lawyers usually doing this, right? Mm -hmm. Sir? Aren't there um, uh, like exemptions, like certain taxes that would come before certain things, even if they were recorded first, like would property taxes be a lien that would take priority? Well, um, that's another question. Which lien always has priority? And uh, Ian said, aren't there exceptions? And yes, there are. Uh, real estate property tax is always number one, isn't it? Uh, if it's not paid, it becomes a lien number uh, January 1. So let me explain that, because uh, he's making a good point. Didn't we say we get the tax bill in August and it's due in September and a lot of us like to pay during the calendar year to get the tax deduction? But we said it's not late until after January 5th of next year, right? So technically, January 5th or 6th might not be, technically, that might not be first. But this is an exception that Ian's bringing up. If you don't pay your real estate property tax, it will be the number one tax lien, and it will be effective January 1st. Now, you're always asked that question. Real estate property tax would be January 1. They have the priority. Now, the only exception would be a, a delinquent tax bill, but the real estate property tax is number one. And some of the other exceptions would be seller financing gets to a jumping line of some things. But the main exception I believe he might be thinking about is that workman's uh, lien, the mechanic lien. Remember we said that if, if somebody does work on your property and you don't pay them, that if they seek a lien, it will be retroactive back to the first day they were at the property. Okay? All right, good discussion there. Uh, special assessments. Um, tell me something that you know about. First of all, what is a special assessment? A one-time fee, a one-time tax uh, for what? An improvement. So I would call it a one-time improvement tax. So an improvement tax would be like uh, sidewalks or roads or lighting on the street. You know, the idea is it's going to improve the property, and so if it's improving your property, you ought to pay your pro rata share, and generally it would be based on the frontage, you know, your lot frontage. What are you getting use of, right? So tell me about what you know the sales contract says about assessments. Do you remember anything from the sales contract, like pending and confirmed? Right. 
Libba said, per our sales contract, if there are special assessments that have been confirmed, the seller pays the whole thing. If there are special assessments that are pending, the buyer pays that. So that tells me that better be disclosed as a material fact because wouldn't a buyer be upset if they found out later that this was being discussed and nobody told them? And so another way I would say this is um, uh, special assessments are not prorated. Special assessments are not prorated. What does prorate mean? Yeah, it means that it's split between the two parties. Pro-rate means to divide fairly between the two parties. And special assessments would not be. By the way, huh? Sorry, seller pays confirmed, and then buyer pays pending. It makes sense. It makes sense? The buyer is going to be the one who will be living there if it's pending, um, whereas the seller had ownership for it uh, when it was confirmed. So, That's right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, that's right. And you know what? I like, I like uh, Yadira saying that. I like her saying it makes sense. When this makes sense to you, it's easier to read the question, isn't it? And, um, and instead of trying to memorize things, if it really makes sense and you can, you might not remember all the exact words, but you can figure it out if it makes sense. Let's talk about tax rates. Remember in uh, North Carolina, taxes are based on... Um, Tax rates, I should say, are based on per $100 of uh, tax assessed value. For every $100 of your tax value, it will cost you whatever they say the rate is, like $1.50 or, or $0.65 cents in the county per hundred or a dollar in the city per hundred. Remind yourself, if you live in the city, you pay county and city. If you live in the county, you only pay county. But per 100 is what North Carolina does. Come on. Um, I know we went over this a lot of times, but access tax? Uh, excise. Uh, sorry, yes, excise tax. Yeah, that's not the same thing, but let's go ahead and talk about it. <coughs> uh, Hamad is bringing up excise tax. Excise tax is um, another way of saying transfer tax. Mm -hmm. It's a seller's cost right. at closing, and you calculate it by dividing the sales price by 500 and multiplying by a dollar. And if you divide the sales price by 500 and it comes up to any change, any number after the decimal, you round up to the next dollar because the register of deeds does not take change. They say, next dollar, please. It's a tax. So um, they don't take change. That's what I would say. So, so, uh, so sales price divided by 500. Times a dollar. Times one dollar. Mm -hmm. And then add it to a uh, dollar. Your, your, uh, uh, your textbook says, okay, everybody. Yes. Your textbook said, if the... Um, if the sales price was that, the textbook says you could, for math, you could just say make that 89.5. Put that, put, put, um, put 89.4 um, in your calculator. What did you say again? The book says it's that, but then they say. I'm, I'm trying, I'm trying to tell you. Hold on. Oh. Okay. <laughs> put 89.4 in, uh, in your calculator, everybody. Excuse me. <laughs> oh, Lord. If the commission saw me scold you, they'd say, don't scold your students. Oh. <laughs> it was recorded. We have editing capabilities. All righty. 89.4, if you put that in your calculator, did you get 178.80 and 80 cents? I do it that way because I know I'm going to round up. And what the book said was, for math purposes, you, you can just go ahead and round this to go into your calculator to calculate it. So in other words, you're not changing the sales price, but if you put 89.5 in the calculator and divide by 500, that says 179 even. Guys, are you following me what I'm saying? I personally don't change my sales price because I think that can mess you up on some other math. If you're working on uh, doing closing questions like how much does the seller get, 
I don't change this. Your book said you can change it to the next 500 increment for the math calculation. That was what I was trying to say. But I just put my real number in because I remember if it comes out to change, round up to the next dollar. Mm -hmm. So you guys do it the way you want to. Um, which way do y'all like doing it? You like rounding it? I think the first way is good. I, I probably won't remember the second way, but the first way is good. You know what? This sounds silly, but I have a hard time figuring out what the next 500 increment would be. I think that's confusing. I mean, uh, I don't know if it's like 750 or 9, 150. I, I don't know. That may, Here's what I'm saying. That takes time to think about it. And so if I just put my sales price in there, remember, raise to the next dollar. Does that make sense? Okay. All righty. Taxing on the meal, you will be asked about this. Taxing on the meal means for every $1,000. So that's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Do you have any questions? North Carolina doesn't do the meal. We do the per 100. Um, well, your book might said we rarely use the meal. I've never known uh, North Carolina taxing on the meal. But um, other states do, and it just means per 1000 Let's get on over to Unit 4, unless you have any questions. You're not going to have any math on uh, the rectangular survey method, and, but you do have a question. Was it someone in here? Was it, was it Justin? It seems like it was somebody in here who said, um, uh, it's interesting, we don't practice the rectangular survey yeah, method. That was, that was you. We laughed about it. He comes to me and says, you know what, we don't practice the rectangle survey method, and there are other methods to describe real estate, and so we're, we're going to be asked about the one that we don't practice. And that does sound funny, doesn't it? You know, because there is the meets and the bounds that uh, is the wordy, the point of beginning you have to have, and there's the um, um, plat book and page, and referencing another legal description found on another recorded um, spot. But the a rectangular survey system, uh, this will be in your national part of your exam, so you will be asked about it. Correct me if I'm wrong, is that the same as the governmental survey? Yes. Uh, uh, Ian said, is the governmental survey the same as the rectangular survey? And it is. So they're the same. The government came up with this in the 1700s, and you remember, just visualize the guys on horseback, the pioneers, and staking out their, their uh, land and getting these acreages. Um, the, uh, and I think I mentioned, well, I didn't mention this to you. I, I don't know that I did. I might have. Uh, there's an old-timey cowboy song, Home, Home on the Range, because we did learn about ranges and township lines and that sort of thing. I would, re I would in Unit 4, if you'll go with me to page 72 and 73, and you see information about sections. So I would study over and make sure that you understand about sections. So a couple of things. In a township, there are 36 sections in one township. A township, remember, is where the lines intersect. And so in a township, there are 36 sections. Each section is one mile square. Do you remember that? Each section is one mile square because we talked about the township that is six across and six down. So a township is six miles square, isn't it? But each little section pulled out of there is one mile square. And if you did the math on that, we did it the, um, to show you, because you don't have to really do it anymore, but that'll tell you that it's 640 acres. So I would remember that one section has 640 acres. And the sections can be broken down into quarters and halves. Remember, we kind of went, started big and then kept going in little, uh, little by little, uh, depending on the description. All righty, any questions on that? Go with me, if you will, to page 77. And you might have a question, you do, on acreage, square footage. This won't be math, but it might just be something like how many square feet are in an acre, and how many are there? 43,560, remember Richard Petty? 
Y'all remember him. Um, and remember that, um, sir, Justin? Uh, I can wait till you're done. Go ahead. That's I don't know if it's in this chapter, but I'm very confused about front footage. About what? Front footage. Yeah, this would be it. The front footage okay. is simply the first number. So if you had a lot size, if they gave you the lot size, and they said that this property is selling for $1,000 per front foot, this would be the number that you would multiply by 1,000. The front footage, that's it. It's the first, it's what faces the front. So you can imagine, Justin, I, I understand what you might be thinking, I think, but the front footage, think about selling a property lakefront, oceanfront, visibility on Battleground Avenue. That frontage carries the weight of the value. So the entire property is valued based on how important that frontage is. So it would be for commercial property or, or like lakefront. People, if you ever get a listing and it's near a lake or, or on a lake or, you, or down at the beach, people clamor for that frontage and they'll pay more for it. So it would be the first number. So you might have a math question on that. So just remember the frontage is the very, very first number. So you just number. made out the 1,000 using that, right? What? I made it up. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. When did that happen? I, I said if this property was selling for 1000 per you. front foot, yes, yes. you would just multiply that. Thank you, yeah, that's not a standard for anything. <laughs> I'm not trying to confuse you at this stage of the game. Don't let me do that. All righty then. Unit 5, D types. Now, a couple of things about this. I would remember the three most common deeds uh, that, we, um, that we have. And the three most common would be general warranty deed, special warranty deed, and quit claim deed. What's the main difference between these deeds? Uh, general, uh, general, the main difference between them all? It's what they want. It's what they want. Yeah, the warranty. The warranty. The guarantee is the main difference, isn't it? Now, we'll break down and talk about the guarantees. But, guys, the main difference between them is the guarantee. And the guarantee is called warranty. Or what are the warranties? That's the main difference. General warranty deed, tell me, what that, uh, tell me about those guarantees. General warranty? Uh-huh. It offers the most protection to the, um, to, I guess, the buyer. Uh -huh. And then it has the most liability on the seller. Okay, Yadira said the general warranty deed gives the most protection to the buyer. What would be the buyer's name in a deed? Uh, the, 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 grantee. The, grantee. Grantee. the grantee. The grantee and the grantor is the seller. And the grantor is the seller. So you could see a question, which deeds gives the best protection to the grantee? General warranty. Which deed gives the most liability to the grantor? general warranty because they're given all warranties. Guys, it's mainly about how long is this warranty. The general warranty is guaranteed forever. Forever means back to origin to always in the future. Whereas the special warranty deed guarantees from since the grantor purchased it going into the future. And the quit claim deed has no guarantee, right? Can you use a quit claim deed to transfer title? Can a quit claim deed be used to transfer title? But no warranty, but it could be used to transfer title. If you were giving property, if your uh, grandma was gifting you land, uh, that could be with a quit claim deed. You, uh, the no warranties wouldn't be a concern, probably, would it? Or maybe it would. <laughs> Who had a question? Angie, did you have a question? What now? It's got all the warranties. It's guaranteed from origin to all the way in the future. It's got it. What I said was, it's the best for the grantee, and it's the most liable liable to the grantor because the seller says, "I'm giving you all guarantees." So that means they've got liability. That's, I think she said general warranty. Oh, you said quit claim? Yeah, I'm sorry. Quit, I was like, quit claim's no guarantee. No guarantee. 
I'm sorry, I heard general. I beg your pardon. I'm not talking to you. Um, so quit claim is my point to you, you can use it to transfer title. Most people don't want a quit claim deed if you're getting property from someone you don't know. We want the guarantees, and even from somebody you know. You want the guarantees, don't you? And in fact, if you remember, on our listing agreement, it says, seller, we want you to use a general warranty deed. On the offer to purchase, it says, the buyer wants a general warranty deed. We want fee simple, marketable title, don't we? All right. Any comments on that? Deed recordation. Now, we talked about recording. Uh, recording. We're in a pure race state. And so tell me why we record a deed. To give constructive notice. What's another reason? The Connor Act, constructive notice, third party, all that goes together. What's another real good reason? What? No, not to be enforceable. Uh, let's talk about that, Jose. Jose said we record a deed to make it in. Listen up a minute. I know they use that word in your book, and I don't like it used there. What he's bringing up is, um, it says that we record a deed to make it enforceable against third-party claims. It says that literally. I don't like that word enforceable there because it, 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 we have another, uh, it means another, it means enforceable, you know, uh, like you can make people do things. It's, it, it, recording a, de a deed does not make it enforceable uh, between the parties. It means that you're making it valid to the world. You're telling everybody given notice. The reason we record a deed, everybody, is to close the transaction. Huh? Conveys title, we close the transaction. Um, um, I haven't told you. I think you ought to read the sales contract, have I? <laughs> you need to read the sales contract. An actual notice is when you move in, right? An actual notice is possession. possession. Constructive notice is recordation. And so, if you get a test question, does a deed have to be recorded to be valid? The answer would be no. no. We record to protect the grantee against third-party claims. And we record to conclude this transaction. In your sales contract, it says that the, con the uh, contract, the co transaction is not concluded until the recordation of the deed, and that's the official closing. Can you repeat that one more time? Sorry, that, last one. Um, that uh, deeds don't have to be recorded to be valid. We record the deed to conclude the transaction, to close the transaction. Um, I might have said something else, but I don't remember now. But guys, let's look at something here. Go with me to page 274, where our sales contract is. And... I'll show you where this is. Actually, it's on page 276. If you look at letter M, it talks to you about closing the transaction. And closing the transaction, um, probably the last step, the final step would be record it. Get it on record. Letter M on 276. Okay, Let, isn't it letter M on 276? Uh -huh. I have a question, like if it was the state exam and it was asking like the requirements for it to be valid and like for North Carolina it's delivery and acceptance. If it was like the national exam, would it be recordation then? No. So it would just stay? This okay. is the same. I didn't know since that just specifically applied to North Carolina, it on the national one, it would be broader. Um, the Connor Act is a North Carolina law okay. that we record to protect against third-party claims, but the seven ingredients for a uh, valid deed are the same. They remain the same. Okay. They remain the same. Good question. All righty, everyone. Uh, title insurance, who does that protect? Well, the lender first, right? Lender. Let's go find that in our textbook. Um, 
Now, you're not wrong when you said buyer, because there is title insurance that we can get called owner's title insurance. And if the lender's protected, you're kind of protected too, because the lender's protected, right? But I would probably answer lender first, because the lender is the one that says they want you to get it. And so title insurance would be on page 104. Uh, it's talking to you about the title insurance there and maybe um, 102 and 3. But anyway, it's, the, it's an insurance policy that will protect the lender in case there are defects that uh, come up later, forgeries that couldn't have been found, anything like that that um, the lender needs protection for. Um, title insurance is a one-time fee, so you pay this at the real estate closing. It's not a renewal premium, page 102, 103. And I really think looking at the chart on 104 would be a good way to study it too. And title insurance, um, if the lender, if the loan is paid off, then the lender's no longer involved, so they won't be protected anymore. If you've got owner's coverage, you're gonna be protected forever. So it would be advisable for uh, when buyers buy uh, property, uh, to uh, the attorney should tell them to get the owner's coverage. Um, I don't know that that would be your place, but I think the attorney should say, I think you ought to get owner's coverage for this. All righty, let's go to unit six, zoning terms. Uh, guys, this should be pretty straightforward, I hope by now. The zoning terms would be on page uh, maybe 114, 15, 16. So the zoning terms that I'm thinking about would be non-conforming use, illegal use, like illegal uh, non-conforming, non-conforming uh, variance, spot zoning, and some of these other types of zonings. What do you know about legal non-conforming use? Grandfathered in. It's like grandfathered in, and what does that mean, Kim? Uh, that, say, if it was residential before and now it's commercial, it can stay residential if they change the zoning because it was that way before they made the change. I like the way she said it. It was that way before they made the change, and you're still allowed to keep using it the way you've been using it as long as it, uh, you're doing it legally. In other words, you wouldn't be allowed to, if you went to get a building permit to change something, it wouldn't be approved because you would have to conform now to what it is. If a legal non-conforming building burnt down, can you rebuild it? Not illegally. No, I mean, Did you say legal? Oh, I said legal, yeah. So it was there, it was grandfathered in and it burned down. Can they rebuild it or is it that's just your It's in. Okay. It's in. Good question. Ian said, what if you have a property that's been grandfathered in? and it's legal, non-conforming, and it burns down, can you build it back the way it was? No. And you can't expand upon it, correct? No. Because all of, anything that would take a building permit, they're gonna say it has to conform to today. So as long as you're using it that way. Uh, a variance, what is a variance? What makes that different than a, a non-conforming? So you're asking for an exception, aren't you? Yeah. If the zoning ordinances or regulations say setback is this, but we want to be we want to be a little closer in, you would go before the board of um, adjustments or whoever the board may be and ask for an exception to the variance rule. I mean, exception to the rule. And so you're saying, can we vary? So you're asking for that. Um, were there any types of zoning um, terms in here that were confusing to you? Did you have, uh-huh? I was going to say, you're talking about confusing. For some reason, I, I keep confusing. Like, how can you, like, specifically know when it's spot zoning versus when it's um, special use? Because they seem to kind of, to me, they, I don't know. So kind of go together? Yeah. Well, I think special use is more like a church in a residential area, conditional use, or schools, uh, that kind of thing. Spot zoning could be a business or something within a residential area. You're asking them, can I just rezone, rezone this little spot? 
and the zoning board is going to say, but does it blend in with the neighborhood? Will it kind of, does it work in this neighborhood? Like having a little coffee shop on the corner of a road where there's a residential, that might blend in pretty good. I wouldn't call that conditional use though. It would be, it was completely rezoned. Conditional use is on the condition it's used for this. So it'd be like schools and churches and things like that. Maybe hospitals, you know, things like that. Is spot zoning always illegal? Yes. No, it's not always illegal. 50-50 chance. <laughs> um, but it makes you feel like it is in your defense. Guys, spot zoning, you would have to get the approval, like I said, and the board's going to say, if we rezone this one little spot, how will it affect the surrounding areas? And sometimes the boards approve it, and sometimes they don't. I remember um, a developer in town bought a one that was looking at a property on the corner of Friendly, and there's a little neighborhood um, on Friendly across from like Ham's Restaurant used to be, and there's like Howie's Pizza there, and it was like a big two-story house. So there's residential back behind it, and it fronts on Friendly though. There are houses that front on Friendly there. And he wanted to have that rezone. He wanted to have a, a coffee shop downstairs and offices upstairs, and they wouldn't approve it. And one reason it wasn't approved is because the neighbors came out. And the neighbor said, we don't want it. Because zoning, you have to talk to the neighbors and a certain amount of feet away, they have to get notified that you're requesting rezoning. And they all came out and fought it. And that works um, from that angle. You've got a question out of this unit, I believe, in your state portion about street disclosure. So tell me what you remember. And this would be on page 120. 121, 122, and 123. Tell me what you remember about streets disclosure. Now, everybody go to 120 in your book, if you don't mind. I don't know if um, Yasmin suggested that you read this. Um, I would read this, um, this law here that they've got, this statute they've got um, uh, in your book. I would read it. it, it only will take you a few minutes to read over it, but I think I would read it because knowing whether the streets are private or public is important. Knowing if the streets are, if they're public or they maintained by the state is important. So tell me, what do you remember about this section? Why is it important to, in the life of a real estate agent? Ian? Because the people who are buying won't, like it's good for them to know if they're, going to be liable for paying for repairs or whatnot and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Ian said, because the buyer, the consumer, would want to know, am I going to be liable for the repairs of potholes and that sort of thing? And so it's a major material fact, isn't it? So I would remember just because the streets have been um, built to um, DOT standards, it does not mean that they will be maintained by the state. So that would be two questions if you were uncertain. I'm not saying every time you show a house and a buyer wants to buy a property that you be careful and find out about the roads. You know, I don't think it gets that fine-tuned. I think you would kind of get a clue, don't you? If you were out in the country maybe and you see a paved road going down and you see a couple of houses off of, you know, on that road, I'm going to ask who maintains the road? Because even if the neighbors all pitched in, wouldn't you want to know, is there some kind of an agreement? Who, who, who tops it off or whatever you call it uh, when it's time to put that black tar on it or whatever you put on it? Um, so you need to ask those questions. If a property is in a, a neighborhood with restrictive covenants, it would be mentioned in there if the roads were privately maintained and um, that sort of thing. All righty then. Let's go to uh, restrictive covenants. When they talk about restrictive covenants, this is on page 123. They also call it protective covenants. Um, tell me what that means. What are restrictive covenants and what's the purpose? Rules. Uh, so the HOA would 
Yeah, HOA, restrictive covenants. Jose said rules. I like that. Uh huh. Maintain value in a neighborhood or well for your home. Good job. Remember when we talked about appraising, we said conformity maintain, helps maintain the value in the neighborhood. And when a developer is beginning this development, they come up with bylaws and restrictive covenants and things like that. It really maintains harmony and conforming neighborhoods maintain value better. And it would be the rules of the area. Remind yourself that everybody, we talked about latches, didn't we? We talked about that the other day. Uh, everybody in that neighborhood has a right to make sure that your neighborhoods are, uh, your neighbors are uh, conforming and obeying the rules because it could, it could uh, impact the value of your property. If the restrictive covenant says um, no business vehicles parked on the on the road and your neighbor keeps coming home their big truck or something guys if if somebody was looking to buy in that neighborhood and came in and saw that big truck sitting on the street every time they come that could be a turnoff couldn't it might not be could be though couldn't it and so you don't want any uh restrictive covenants um uh violated um because it affects everybody and so restrictive covenants could be something like, if you're building in here, you gotta have at least this amount of square footage. If you're building in here, you, uh, your garages have to face on the side, not on the front. That's one of the things that horrifies me. When I come home and my garage door's open because my son's gone home, I just rush and get in there and say, close that garage because it's junky. <laughs> and it's embarrassing, you know, to have your garage open and all your, ugh, it just looks bad. Believe it or not, some neighborhoods could have that in a restriction. Keep your garage door closed if, if not in use or something like that. I mean, it sounds like a silly pet peeve. Um, I had a builder in a class um, years ago and he says, Jan, every time we build a development, we put in our restrictive covenants, no pit bull dogs and no rock roller dogs allowed in this neighborhood. And the reason is, and I know they've gotten a bad rap, I get it, but the reason is the insurance. Um, insurance, um, uh, it's a liability thing. And so if there's a neighborhood with the common areas, there's going to be a master liability insurance policy. And, uh, and then everybody else, of course, would have their own uh, personal insurance, but it's liability. And so, you know, the developer's thinking about that also at the beginning because he's going to be in charge of the development until that neighborhood's built out or close to being built out where he'll turn it over to the homeowners to let them decide. Ma'am? Um, isn't there something about, let's say, your storage shed must be approved, blah, 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 and somebody does not do that, puts in a hot pink storage shed in the back. <laughs> Isn't there something that is going to be okay if nobody reports it? It's called latches. That is oh, the latches. latches. Okay. Latches is, um, let, let's use your example. Um, um, uh, uh, Libba said, what if in the restrictive covenants it says no storage sheds um, to be seen from the front of the road or, or don't paint your storage sheds or whatever. And one of your neighbors puts a storage shed up in the backyard and they made it look like a little dollhouse and it's all pink and all that. And it's a clear violation for the people who know what the rules are. It's a violation. Anybody in that neighborhood can knock on the door. It doesn't take the president of the association. Anyone can approach them and say, you're violating the restrictive covenants in this neighborhood. And because the, uh, there's an architectural committee that's supposed to approve that, and clearly it wasn't. And so if you don't ma uh, make them aware, even though they should be aware, if you don't, you could lose your right to do anything about it. And that's called latches. Is there a certain time period? Uh, Ian said, is there a certain time period? And I'm going to say no, because I think it just depends. Personally, I think if you notice somebody painting their house purple, that somebody needs to stop before they finish. I mean, you know, if you wait until they weeks painting it, putting the second coat on it and all of that, golly, why didn't you stop me when you first saw me? But um, I think it's going to be case by case. Uh -huh. Going off of that, that's what I was going to ask. Yeah. But if you go to sell the house next door and somebody sees it, you know, if they can see it from their backyard, oh, I don't like that. Is there a time limit on that? Like, does it run out? No, there's not a time limit. Um, 
there's not a time limit. The whole idea is if, if, it, if people don't um, approach it in a timely manner, if it goes to court, because that's where it have to go, because the homeowners are going to look for an injunction. And if it goes to court and the judge says, how long has this house been painted purple? A year. Why didn't y'all say something about it before? Over, overthrown, thrown out, whatever they say. So I don't think there is a time limit. It probably would be reasonable. What's reasonable about this? How long have they been doing this? And um, I know one of our restrictions in our neighborhood, somebody started talking in the neighborhood about not wanting the basketball goals on, in front of the house on near the driveway. And I'm thinking, really? Where would you put them? I mean, uh, in, in your backyard, rolling up and down the hill, all, all, all like that. And, and when we got notice about that, we walked out in our street and house, 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 basketball, basketball goal, basketball goal. And so when people, because what you said, Libba, once somebody does it and they get away with it, everybody else is going to do it. And then it becomes the precedent, and it's almost like that restrictive uh, rule no longer exists. It'd be hard to enforce if everybody's getting away with it. Yeah, making all the calls. <laughs> She's everywhere. <laughs> all right, everybody. Let's take a quick break so we can make some payway in the agency and contracts. Quick, quick, quick. quick. <laughs>